you are listening to the podcast That's Life in Sweden or as we say in Swedish Sontilivet i Sverige with me, your host Lisa Osimäki. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Amuda Pubalan who is a country director for International Higher Education Teaching and Learning Association, or HETOL. She's also the senior editor of journal for the Journal of Applied Research in Higher Education. Welcome to the program, Amuda. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's an honor to be part of this. Oh, fantastic. And you're so welcome. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. And it's a beautiful day in Aberdeen in Scotland. So, yes, I'm good. Wonderful. Uh, now, you worked, uh, to just to get a sense of a little bit about your background, now you worked as a clinician. You are a medical doctor. You trained in India in Velour. And, and so before you decided to train in, as an educator in public health at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, can you ex- just share with us what was it that attracted you, first of all, to become a medical practitioner or a doctor and then um, and join academia? Thank you, Lisa. Um, as you said, I um, trained in a medical school called Christian Medical College in Valor in South India. Um, that hospital was about 30 minutes away from where I grew up. And I come from a remote rural area in South of India. And many of my relatives, everybody around me went to that medical school uh, and the medical college uh, hospital uh, that's linked to it. And the treatment and the care that was provided was great. And probably when I was young, as a teenager, probably that's what attracted me to become a, a doctor walking around with coats and stethoscopes, but also the care that the hospital provided, which s- slowly started drawing me to become a, a clinician. So after I graduated from CMC in Velo, I worked as a clinician in another remote rural area working in leprosy as a medical officer in infectious diseases. At that point, I didn't know anything about research. I was a pure clinician working away in a rural area. But there was a research project commissioned by a Belgian charity at that point, and I was a clinician on it. And without knowing anything, I just did what a clinician was supposed to do on a research project, but saw how evidence can be put together, collated together, that go on to change practice and policy for the benefits of patients. So the results of that research project um, became that background and the basis for me to take those conversations up with my higher authorities and change some practices which will benefit the patients. And then I was attracted to uh, research and being in public health, health promotion is always part of public health especially through education that could be to patients, to public uh, or healthcare professionals. And especially when I was working in leprosy, which was a disease that was stigmatized in the part of the country I come from, education was core element of what I did. And I started teaching that to nurses, to doctors. Uh, And I think that was the beginning of my journey into academia. Um, After working for four years there, teaching and doing little research projects, I moved to UK for family reasons. Mm. I followed my husband here and uh, decided to move into academia completely. So that's my little narrative. You also mentor and you support trainee doctors. Is that what you did in India at the time when you were Working? Not as much then, because I was a clinician who was straightforward teaching um, the, the clinicians, healthcare professionals. But slowly I realized that um, the learning work environment and the lived experiences of healthcare professionals can have an impact on their attainment. Uh, and sometimes what they feel 
their experiences and perceptions also impact on their career decisions and staying in nursing, staying in medicine, the retention of it, and also the satisfaction that they get out of it. So I started researching after I came to UK how mentoring is perceived by trainee doctors. Um, they get clinical tutors. Uh, in many countries uh, where they are guided through the tick boxes, the procedures that they need to do, um, things like that. But how and where do they go for things like their experiences when they feel stressed out, burnout? Is there a mentoring available for these young trainee doctors, which hopefully will give them a better experience? So that's how I got into the research uh, into and supporting the trainee doctors. Mentoring is something that I didn't know because when I came from India, a lot of people support you. There was no term for it. You just walk in and you get mentored, I suppose. You know, we call it mentoring. Mm. But my story of making that mentoring, although you read about it, my lived experience of mentoring was my own story of making the transition from India. So when I came here, as I said, I trained in a good medical school. It's an elite medical school. I learned quite a lot, but the ethos of that school was to work in remote and rural. So I landed up four years working in very remote areas in India. And all of a sudden I mm. was uh, here in UK. I find myself in a place which is so different from where I grew up and trained. So that was a huge physical transition for me, including the weather in the Northeast of Scotland was very different. And the other transition I made was from being a clinician, full-time dabbling in research to making the decision of acad academia, which means I had to do some further studying, further education. And that it's a huge transition coming from an Indian education system to a UK education system. And those transitions made me... Um, lose my path a little bit because you're a bit overwhelmed. You are good, you're a doctor, you're trained and you have achieved all of this. I ran a hospital, but all of a sudden you're a student again, you're in academia, you're in a different country, you're a different environment. And during that struggle, some of the things that helped me was this mentoring who I bumped into in a corridor or somebody who said, how are you? And you get chatting and that happened, that helped me and I'm still here. But now I'm on the other side of the table, as it were, coordinating master's programs, looking after students and education has become so internationalized now that students move across the globe for education much more than 25 odd years ago when I came over. So given that my students are ethnically and culturally so diverse and for these students transitions can be quite challenging and I am mostly involved in postgraduate uh, um, teaching and postgraduates is only one year in UK. So the students who come here don't have time, like even undergraduates of three or four years to get their fit and get their bearings right. They come and hit the ground running. And sometimes it can be quite challenging and overwhelming. So I identified the challenges over the few years of um, mm. rote learning, which was a biggest problem for me. The system in India is you memorize a lot of things and you reproduce in an exam and you will pass really well. Um, but that's not the fact here. And it's a different way of learning. Um, for me, lectures was the only way that I learned. You turn up to a lecture. But education system, the learning, the ways of learning is changing. Here, we focus more on seminars, uh, discussion boards where people put their comments on. We do flipped classroom where students are expected to uh, engage with the learning material before they come to class and in the class, all that happens is an interactive session. But if you come from a system where you're not exposed to all of that, it can be quite daunting. And culturally, you don't challenge your teachers. You don't ask them what they say is what is right. You don't negotiate that conversation. But here, that's encouraged. 
there is no right and wrong answer. You read about it and you uh, provoke that discussion with your mm-hmm. tutors to have that challenge. So that's one challenge that I encountered by making the transition myself. And the assessments are very different. I grew up in education system, everything is based on exam, end of term exam. But when I came here, you have formative assessments, you have summative assessments, uh, and there are multiple assessments. And those are varied as well. You will have one multiple choice, one essay, one exam, one video presentation. So if you're not used to it, these things can be quite challenging for students. So I've done two things over the years. One is prepare the students before they come here of these different ways of learning, this diversity Mm -hmm. in education, the diversity in learning culture, uh, diversity of educational culture here. And also I use my orientation week before they start studying about the concept that helped me learn over a long periods of time, things like critical thinking. What does that even mean when people say critically look at the literature? What, how do students understand that? Um, when they say do wider reading, what do they understand that? Because when I was told do wider reading, I started reading multiple books back to back. Uh, in a back to front, because that's what I thought was wider reading until somebody told me, read the concept using different sources, the same concept, understand it by reading a paper, understand it by listening to a podcast, uh, understand it by reading a textbook. So that was very different way of, so I did a bit of preparatory work with students in my orientation week and before they come here. One other thing that I did was I developed a a support mentoring program called Success Plus. It has an abbreviation which is underpinned by matching students um, with the same career pathways, if I make sense. So people who have come from a particular country with a specific pathway, like myself coming from India, coming as a clinician, but my aim is to become an academic. So they are doing that master's as a step one of that journey. So I started finding members of staff who are willing to mentor those students. So for some, the mentoring was not about academic things at all, because they were very bright, they knew what they were doing. But things like, I'm a medic, do you think I should go into academia? What are the advantages and disadvantages of it? Including, is it conducive for family life? How did you cope having a child and studying? And how about salary? I mean, these are personal things, which when they come, they don't know where to go. So I started matching up these students based on their needs with mentors. And that really helped. And I evaluated it what worked and what didn't work. So that's continuing. So that's my story of transition about mentoring and how I saw mentoring and a couple of things that I have done to improve that support. Doesn't matter whether they are master's level students or trainee doctors, giving that support of what they need. It is time consuming, but when you identify what they need, it could make a difference. And that's my passion. So I've done few bits like that, Lisa, yes. without boring you with all my stories. Yes. No, <laughs> not at all. Absolutely not yeah. at all. I think you just, um, and I consider that, um, you know, for what, it, you know, I, I think that's just the way we have to teach yeah. today. Mm. It's to get to know our students, who they are. But before we can do any of that, we have to be aware of who we yeah. are. You coming from India, you are fully aware mm. about the challenges and experiences moving to a new country. A member of staff have made this transition like me, studying in one country and now teaching in another country. As you said just now, you are aware, you understand um, as a member of staff, as a teaching staff, possibly what students go through and the transitions. But if you haven't traveled uh, and you're a teacher here, 
sometimes it's hard for them to understand when students behave in a particular way. There are students who knock on the door when they come because they know they have a meeting, but there are some cultures that do not knock on the door, they stand outside. And you might think, oh, you know, just come in. Why do these students stand outside? And why do they not ask? I'm putting all these tutorials in and I give them time at the end of the lecture, but they do not ask me anything. They're so quiet. But probably members of staff don't understand these are not acceptable in some countries or that is their education culture where they come from. They wait. They don't ask members of staff to give an appointment. Um, so easily. They take time to think through. So members of staff uh, might not recognize that. So I've done a little mini courses for members of staff where students come in and talk about a friendly uh, sessions where they talk about the challenges that they met and how they um, mitigated those. And also another session with members of staff like myself who have come as a student or started teaching and our struggles. And we share good practice of members of staff who have done little things like what I just mentioned before, that career pathway yes. mentoring. And a lot of members of staff have done little things like that. Uh, and to highlight that to the whole university, uh, which then led to something in our university called Open to All Conversations, where we have that safe space where when you don't know how to handle a student or a group of students coming from a different mm -hmm. culture, just coming and speaking to somebody saying, is this okay if I said this to the student, will they be offended? Because members of staff don't know. They don't want to offend students, but sometimes knowledge uh, is important. So we've done both uh, for the students and kind of mentoring or supporting the staff as well. Yeah. Mm. And so what you've actually done, you're providing a so-called psychological safety for both your colleagues yes. as well as for students. Yeah, yeah. And that is an, it, that is about culture awareness. It just doesn't happen without the conversation. Yes. And sometimes this conversation can be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because we don't know. Uh, I don't know about your culture. Yes. What, what, are, were, what were the norms? Mm -hmm. But if, if there is a person like yourself who's open, who understands the challenge, it doesn't really matter what what part of the world yeah. we come from, but just having had that experience, mm. you're creating par automatic in my perspective yeah. a psychological safety. Yes. yes. So now you are you are a researcher with extensive experience in international collaboration. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the challenges with international collaboration and what you consider works to ensure sustainable mm. collaborations? Mm. Uh, when I started thinking about collaborating widely, um, it is a daunting thought because how do you approach these kind of things? But as you said, I have done few collaborative studies. I've established MOUs with several uh, medical schools across the world. If I think back and reflect on what is it that really made it work, and I have wonderful relationships with them, uh, any opportunities we get, we try and travel and go to each other's countries to deliver workshops and and I always reflect on what is it that makes it and if there's one thing I think that makes it successful and sustainable I think it's trust so oh, yes. yeah because when you first start um, yes, you have these formal conversations, everybody's formal, and you think there is the possibility of collaboration, you sign a MOUs, and all that happens, and there is no doubt about it. But when you actually land up in another country or with another research group, you sense you're an outsider. I feel that you are watched by different people because they are looking for why why is this person or this group here what what are they doing i feel you know you you sense that feeling that you you are an outsider and you're watched and people are looking for do we have a hidden agenda here um and and also uh, th that is my first challenge i would think you know you feel a bit sensitive mm -hmm. about the whole thing although superficially you're talking you're smiling but you do feel feel that sense of being an outsider and people are watching you, people are looking for hidden agendas. One other thing that I've learned and quite early on I switched on is 
when you go in, there are processes in places already in other universities. And when I go, what I reflected and went with was to understand those processes that are already in place, regulations that are already in place. That helped me not to impose what I go with saying, what I come with is better than what you have here already. When that happens, I don't think it will go very well. But understanding their regulations, because they have a reason why they do it that way. And without understanding, I don't think it can move forward. So becoming part of it, and then that trust starts to uh, uh, come in. And once that trust comes in, I think you can take it a step further. You can laugh about things that they do. They can laugh about things that we do. But that respect comes in, that equal partnership comes in. And I think that really works. Um, and also, it's not about when I go into a lot of countries, it's not about what can I do for you, but it's about what can we learn from each other. What a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. And I think over the years I've learned it, it, it I wouldn't say I went with it and I knew what I, when I started collaboration, this is how I did it. But I think it's over the years. You know, sometimes you come away a bit, gosh, you know, did that go well at all? And nothing stops me by sending an email to that person I spoke and say, Hey, how did you think our conversation went? How did your institute feel about this couple of meetings that we had? And they also think, gosh, do I say to this person everything that we discussed? But they will say, um, this went really well. We all liked that concept. But the other one you mentioned, actually we do this and we like it. So I think that slowly builds up. And once that respect comes in, and asking them, this is a wonderful thing you do. Why not we work together, improve it, and I can take it to my institute and use it. And I think that trust is for me did it. And understanding the landscape, understanding the regulations of where you are going and treating the same way when they come in to have that free open conversation builds the trust. Yes. So when you talk about regulations, now I'm, I'm a little bit curious about that. What do you mean by regulations? Are we talking about the values or the... Yeah. So it yeah. Is? let me use an example to say that when we recruit medical uh, students, um, we follow one methodology, which is MMI, which is a multiple mini interviews that we use to um, uh, recruit uh, our medical students. So one of the institutes uh, I work with, they do recruitment using selection centers, which means it's a group of people who have, um, it's based in the center, students go and live there for three days, or they travel there for three days. There are multiple tasks, some assessing knowledge, some assessing um, their logic, some assessing the values of, are you the right person to become a doctor? So some medical schools have those practices and they have done it for years and years and years and years, set up by somebody in 1940s. They carry on. And I'm an academic and I do a lot of research on recruitment medical and there are reviews done. So in my mind, I know one method is better than the other as an academic. So when somebody invites me to another country and say, come and help me to better our recruitment, to get the right people into medical school, when I go there, as a first step, I ask, how do you recruit? What are the things that you do? And for example, they, they tell me what they do. As an academic, I know it's a selection center, but they might not even know that terminology because they're not academics. There are people who traditionally have done it that way. And also as an academic, I know A is better than B, but there is a practice that's there already. So instead of going and say, I know I'm an academic, this works better, so you should change your practice. 
you learn about what they do and you understand the logic behind why they do what they do and using your skills potentially make it better, make it more evidence-based for me is a better collaboration. trust with some it's the first meeting there's something that clicks but with some individuals organization institutions it takes long time and we need that patience to work at it if we believe in what we want to do and you come from a very traditional area yes. of expertise mm -hmm. medicine yeah. my yeah. goodness yeah. now that is very traditional very conservative yeah. you know so I mean, kudos to you <laughs> <laughs> to speak so openly. Yeah. Um, to another, you, you, you have your research interest, I find, is just fascinating. And it goes back to what you began mm. or when we began the, the conversation. And so to learn more, can you talk about the lifestyle and health be behavior changes? Yeah. So my PhD was looking at young adults uh, who are between 18 to 24, uh, which WHO has listed as at-risk group. Uh, the reason I got interested was, as I said, when I moved into academia, I did a, a master's degree and I started working as a research assistant. And at that point, early 90s, obesity and the non-communicable diseases that went with obesity was massive and it was escalating. And at that point, there were a lot of interventions that happened at schools for younger children. Uh, and there were a lot of interventions that were published uh, in adults. Um, and I did a piece of work where we did a big review looking at what's the best intervention for reducing obesity generally. And if we have identified one good, wonderful, magical bullet that can reduce obesity, how does that impact on all the conditions that are related to obesity, like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease? So we did this big review and we found there are some interventions which will make you lose weight. And uh, if you lose weight, there are some improvements in some conditions. But one of the things that came up was that Anything that we do is not sustainable for a long time because lifestyle is not easy thing like popping a pill every night. Um, and given the world, how it's moving, lifestyle keeps changing. So part of that work was everybody started talking about prevention. You know, let's not get people there being obese or getting into these disease conditions. And when we looked at prevention, again, there was quite a lot on children. Um, and quite a lot on adults. Children, possibly because you can target them, they're in one place at schools, and it was easier to do those things. And then I mapped the life course of a person to see where this work uh, is being conducted. What I found was this young people, as it were, who are between, I don't know, 16, 17 to about 25, and there was nothing, nothing done in that age group um, regarding obesity or the diabetes or anything that's happened. So this is a very important transitional age for the reasons that people leave home to go to university in some countries and they become independent. They have to fend for themselves. They have to manage their finances and they're studying possibly and the pressures are there. Some move away from home to start work. Again, that same kind of pressures come on to these young people. Um, and there is a bit of freedom where you've been monitored and maintained by your parents. And all of a sudden, you're away at university with friends who want to have fun in year one. So all of that, and they begin to live with partners, potentially. They want to impress them. So all of that puts them at a risk. Become, makes them vulnerable to risky behavior. So my interest started twigging towards this group. And my PhD work was looking at individual behavior change theories on how to uh, look at the components that lead to behavior change and how to modify 
small changes in their lifestyle um, and look at their healthy behavior over a long period of time. And one of the fascinating things that came out, just one example of what uh, came out of it was, the young people want to eat healthy, there's no doubt about it, and they make an effort. But when stresses of exams and comes, no matter what you say to them, they actually don't care because it's a stressful time. So they want to rustle up something quickly or t get a takeaway and have fun. And also the other thing that uh, came out was we always tell them, if you become obese, you will get diabetes or hypertension. In that part of their life course, actually, they don't care what happens to them 20 years down the line. It's about here and now is what mattered to that young people. So learning that was amazing during my PhD. And we were able to educate people who do health promotions when they are targeting these people to tell them with evidence, don't tell them about 20 years down the line, tell them about you will look fresh, you will look hydrated, you will look beautiful if you don't drink so much alcohol or you know, identifying what is important for them and modifying their behavior. So that, that's something. And then my interest moved into, so if people are going through those transitions across their life course, how about countries that are going through transition? And India is one of a prime example of traditional cooking, mothers staying at home, looking after children. It's changing. Um, the traditional the women are working. There are fast chains. I grew up where there are corner shops to buy your groceries, but now it's prepackaged, easy, accessible supermarkets. So some countries are going through transition. So my work slowly started moving into understanding that uh, economic transitions, cultural transitions, um, and one of those transitions also people moving from urban, uh, from rural to urban areas, because. Agriculture is a very stressful thing for people. They are relying on, especially countries where there is no drip feeding the plants, they are relying on rains and it is stressful. So young people think going into cities and working in supermarkets or call centers is a salary paid every month. So those transitions are happening and some make it and some don't. And they don't want to go back to the rural area to see as to be seen as a failure. So that uh, goes into that spiral of depression. And so these changes are very complex, where there are undernutrition in some areas and overnutrition, bringing in the double burden concept in the same community. So I've done some bits of work there. Uh, these are that's triggered from my PhD and how I approach the life course and behavior changes, mm. if I'm making sense, yeah? Mm. Absolutely. And you know, it is such an interesting and important area of research. And I'm, pretty, I'm especially interested, um, what, is you, what was your experience of um, during COVID? Mm. Did you, how did you find the transition, yeah. you know, when we went into lockdowns mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. Um, we did one piece of work um, looking at how it impacted people. Um, the outcomes we looked at was the physical activity. Uh, and that actually, I looked at older people um, because the younger generation had the technology as their advantage. So when technology kind of improved so much in such a short period of time during COVID, the young people were able to connect very quickly with Facebook and as you saw, but some of the elderly were a bit lost in that um, engaging with their friends because they couldn't go out, they couldn't work the technology to have that communication. And so that was difficult and we, we a couple of pieces of work that we did was to buddy the elderly people with younglings that could be their own grandchildren or somebody who was a neighbor's children. So we set up something and that worked really well. And in terms of education, students did struggle. And again, they couldn't, some could go back to their own country and at least they were with the families. Some could not get back and they were stuck in their own rooms. Um, and it was very hard as a, 
as an academic lead for programs to support them. I found it difficult. But I did little things to energize them. What I asked was to ask them to go for a walk on their own because they couldn't do uh, meet uh, other people. And I asked them to take photographs of flowers and post okay. it on the, um, on the program page. And I did Teams meetings where I asked people to talk about that flowers. And a lot of people came from different countries. They're the ones who got stuck here. And for them who have never seen a daffodil or a crocus, uh, I, I remember these uh, names of the flowers because the lockdown came in March. And those are the flowers in Aberdeen, which blossoms beautifully, <laughs> tulips. So they took the pictures of the flowers. Obviously, they didn't know what it was. So I asked them to go and do a little research about that flower. Uh, and they came and talked about it, what each flowers mean, because flowers have meanings, what it represents. So that bonded them. Uh, and those are the little things that I did in terms of education to keep them together. And uh, in terms of clinical things, elderly are the most uh, affected and we help to buddy them with younger generation to help them support. Yeah. I haven't heard that one before, you know, about taking pictures of flowers. What a wonderful, you're very creative. <laughs> Thank you. Not only are you medic, you're a doctor, but you're also creative. <laughs> I mean, my passion, you know, I've done public health in uh, both in India and here, as I said, I've done a lot of lifestyle behaviors. And then I gradually moved into education. Now, majority of my job is uh, education and uh, developing programs, um, faculty development. So that's what I'm doing. But my passion, if you think, I mean, actually, uh, I don't think very often what next for me, but so what my passion what I want or love to do, which I've started doing, is combining both my public health and education. So one piece of work that I've done with India is in Indian education system, as you know, we don't have as many doctors um, for the population that we have. And that goes to a lot of other countries like Nepal um, and other countries uh, like in Africa uh, dabbled in, in Nigeria, it is a problem of healthcare professional proportion to uh, the need that's there. So in India, what we have is some what they call health aids. So these are grassroots workers who are in the villages and what they do is to uh, assist doctors. They go and talk to villagers and bring them to the clinics. So that's the health aids. And what I have done is sometimes these health aids are very bright young people. They don't go to university, not because they cannot, they have the academic ability, but they live in remote rural areas. Universities are in cities. Sometimes they have to walk, take a bus or walk back in the dark and families don't allow them. They say, that's enough. We, we can't. So th there are a lot of factors that play a part in not allowing this young men and women to go to university. So what I have done is I work in diabetes and cancer now. So what we have done is working with uh, people on the ground. We took a diabetes course for nurses. And using my education skills of developing courses, we took that content and developed a basic diabetes course for these health aids. Once that was developed, I went into villages and spoke to the chieftains or heads of villages and muted the idea of, look, you have all these young people and I completely understand why you don't want to risk sending them to universities in dark and alone and they can't afford because education is private. How about training them in these conditions which who what they can learn from it? So after negotiating with them, we did some courses. We took the course to them and trained these young people in the clinical condition. So they learned what are the symptoms and signs of diabetes and also taught them little tests like the drop blood test to assess the hemoglobin and little, you know, you test their feet, whether they feel the sensation um, and these kind of little things, check their blood pressure. So little 
clinical tasks, and also the basic knowledge of diabetes. Then we worked with the industry partner. I had a couple of tablets left over from previous research projects. And what we did was we worked mm. with this company and developed a program. I'm not tech savvy, don't ask me how, but they created a program where you can track the care pathway of a particular patient. So we gave the tablets to these young people who know what they're talking about now, and they can go into the villages and track these patients because some of them don't know whether they are, um, whether it's time to go and get their ophthalmology checkup, their eyes checked, or is it time to go and get their mm -hmm. renal kidneys checked because they just carry on. And if they um, go to the main hospital, that's a day's wage lost. And if that person is the only earning member, they rather go to work rather than go to the doctor. So we use these trained health aides to track the pathway, to motivate them, to energize them. And if everything is okay, they check their feet and their feet is fine. They don't have to go to the main hospital, which takes a whole day. So that is combining my public health understanding diabetes and cancer and using my education, developing courses skills to combine those two. I have to admit, Lisa, that was so satisfying. That's my pride. And I really oh. loved it because we went back and uh, evaluated that program. And some of the quotes yeah. from these health aides was quite heartwarming and quite satisfying because they said previously they just will go and say, the doctor should see you. Have you been to the clinic? But now I can listen. And when they say their symptoms, I know whether it's dangerous or not. So I go with a knowledge and they are proud of that knowledge. Yes. So th I think that was really satisfying for me. And what next for me? I think I would like to do more of that, develop for other conditions um, and capacity build in resource limited settings like a lot of India. And, and that project now is being rolled out to whole of uh, uh, region in South India because, yeah, the, uh, because it didn't, it, it wasn't inferior compared to doctors and nurses doing that level of tracking their care pathway. So that's published. So we have that evidence to convince people to do that. And the more we do, we'll be building capacity using these young minds to build their knowledge up. And then we can use them to support clinicians, mm. support researchers to collect data because they are the in people. They are the ones who are trusted by communities and some tribal communities are very closed people. They will trust only their own. Yes. And using these young minds to train them will be useful in shifting the tasks in these uh, areas where there is not very many resources, I think. I, at least I think. And I would like mm -hmm. to do more of that if I can. I think it sounds so, so Oh, it fantastic. I'm just, yes, I'm just blown Thank away. You, Lisa. That Thank is you. just so impressive. Um, yeah, it's altruism. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. It, you know, a lot of, I, I always look at doctors and I look at nurses mm. and I look at anyone in the health industry or education. Yeah. It's about service, it's about being altruist, uh, altruism and caring. And you certainly are, are an example of that. Thank you. Um, Oh, you are so welcome. Now, just thinking about now on the 12th, between 12th and 14th yeah. of June, your university, Aberdeen University in Scotland, will host the HEATOL conference titled Reimagining mm -hmm. Collaboration and Compassion. Yeah. And I think you will, you, I'm sure you will give a wonderful talk <laughs> at the conference, especially about mm -hmm. this topic. Uh, but can you talk about the conference yeah. a little bit? So, um, I always wanted to bring people together, networking and learning from each other. As I said, it's always my way of establishing that trust and which leads later on into research and educational collaboration. So when I was thinking about it, uh, we obviously put a bid and we talked to organizations to host a conference. 
and I was thinking about what could be the theme of this conference. And I went to my VP for my vice principal for education. And our vision for Aberdeen University, which was set up um, 14th century, it's open to all. That's our foundations of University of Aberdeen. And a lot of things that mm. come out of um, that vision is the themes and what we do. So I thought, why not, you know, in our group, along with our vice principal, we thought, why don't we look at what we believe in? And sometimes these um, strategies that come out are mostly in research. People look at it as mm. research strategies. When we say international, they only think about international uh, research projects. Um, but we thought, why not translate that into education? So our four uh, strategic vision, the pillars, I call it, are inclusive, being international, being interdisciplinary, and sustainable. So these are the four pillars, and we've pitched this conference uh, based on those four. Um, and that aligns with our vision of being open to all. Uh, so all of these four pillars, we are hoping that there will be educational elements, how inclusion plays out in education, how sustainability plays out in education. So that's our hope anyway. So we uh, have put out a call and we've got a lot of abstracts submitted. So we're looking at that abstracts now. And we are hoping we will be able to bring a lot of educators uh, and pedagogical researchers uh, and hear about the work that they are doing across the globe who have strived to incorporate these elements into their education. And education is global. Uh, as you said, during COVID, how did you manage? Education took such a big hit and a turn because some countries where we can afford to, we were able to put technology in so quickly and make it a smooth, but how can education be uh, done and translated, converted so quickly in a country where they don't have enough resources? And it'll be wonderful to see how they managed those kind of transitions and uh, delivered and made their education sustainable in the two years when we all came to a standstill. So we're looking forward to bringing those elements and listen to these wonderful talks mm -hmm. by educators across the globe um, and hopefully bring that compassion and collaboration as a forefront of promoting education, I think, hopefully. It will be fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Amuda, for for your time and I certainly hope to invite you back another time to further discuss and maybe even talk about how did the conference, um, yeah. what were the results mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. conference? Absolutely. Maybe. Thank you so much, Elisa, for the opportunity. Uh, actually made me think a lot, reflect a lot about what I've done over the years uh, for, for this. So thank you. And you have been listening to the podcast Sånt i livet i Sverige or in English That's Life here in Sweden with me Lisa Åsimäki. Till next time, take care of yourself and each other. Bye for now. <laughs>